and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Evan Levy from Integral Data. Did you know Dataversity offers free monthly webinar series and online conferences throughout the year? Stay in the loop when you follow us on Twitter at Dataversity or on Instagram at Dataversity underscore EDU. Get podcast extras and bonus content when you subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash Dataversity. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Evan Levy, a partner at Integral Data. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Evan, hello and welcome. It's terrific to be here. I really appreciate the time. And I'm quite anxious to see where our conversation goes this afternoon. Oh, I'm so excited. And I know you're a speaker coming up at Enterprise Data World in Anaheim. Um, and you've spoken at many of our conferences. So, you know, it's, I'm really grateful. I know you are renowned for, you know, everyone's like, where is it? Where is everybody? Like, oh, they're in Evan's session. <laughs> I, I, I hope that's Standing even room half, only. I hope huh? that's a half truth. I hope that's a half truth. That would be, <laughs> that would be fun. I, I, I do enjoy um the conference because it's always interesting not only to share some of your thoughts, but also to hear the feedback and the questions. I used yeah, to, yeah joke with friends it's like the, my favorite part of a conference or a session is when they i call it stump the chump where you get lots of questions and some people are out there trying to, to stump you but others just want to know if we have any thoughts and suggestions now they can they can thread a needle and, and solve their problems and it's always interesting it keeps us on our toes and it forces us to maintain our level of knowledge and learn it does and yes i mean you are but you are known as a as a as a very popular speaker you know great topics great speaker great content so Always appreciate that. And I'm so excited to use some of that talent today and have you talk about your bio and how you got into data. So um, you're a partner at Integral Data. So, and that's a little, so you're also the owner of these and the yeah. sole employee and the, <laughs> but so tell me about Integral Data. So tell me why you started this company. Uh, well, let me give you a quick brief background. I am, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, I had a management consulting firm for a number of years and, and mm -hmm. it was acquired back in 2011. I went and joined an insurance company, was there for a, a bit of time and decided to get back into consulting. And um, mm -hmm. Integral Data is me. It's a boutique consulting firm. I hire people as projects require that. And, but mostly it's about focusing and supporting the clients uh, that, that contact me and the people that we want to help. And I'm fairly busy, so certainly no complaints in that regard. And got a little bit of a reputation of following because of the types of things that we do. So it was really just a mechanism for me to continue con to consult. Oh, I really like that. So tell me about the types of things that you do. Well, it, 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 it's funny because when uh, I think a lot of us in the technology world have to describe to our parents or our family members, what is that you do? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I joke, I fix broken data. Mm -hmm. And that obviously takes a lot of turns, but I think most organizations struggle where organizations are very, very good at storing data. It's like I've got bookcases behind me and I can jam all kinds of books in the bookcases, but inevitably one of the questions I would ask in class is, okay, could you name the books that you have or even find them? And I spend a lot of my time um, helping clients do one of two things. Um, one is, okay, you want to analyze and study what is it you're trying to accomplish from a business perspective and help them not only communicate and identify that, but then understand, okay, if this is the type of stuff I want to analyze because of the actions I want to take, I want to identify trends so I know what to sell, or I want to make sure that my costs are under control. Well, then we have to organize the data so they can actually find it and use it. And then the, the real game is how do you not fall prey or fall into the trap of I won't organize the data to solve one problem? Really what we want to accomplish with most enterprise environments is how do we make that data multi-purpose? Um, so it's actually packaged, ready to use, regardless of the need, whether it's a screen pop up on an operational system or someone wants to build a report or now the craze with AI and machine learning, be able to grab it and use it in the way that you want. So uh, tend to focus most of my energy in the data management space, but inevitably focus uh, and get pulled into the analytics space because of my background in various uh, industries. 
Makes sense. So what is your typical work like look like or what's your typical uh, uh, use case with a client? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know that I could ever tell you that I that I have a, uh, a typical use case. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's a fair number of folks that show up at, at EW like me, and we are really a product of our experiences. Mm -hmm. um, my first job was at Walt Disney World, and I was a jungle skipper. The guy that piloted the boat, uh, turned the speed up and down, tried not to soak people and pull out a gun to shoot an invisible elephant. Um, but, but I mentioned that because it, it taught me about what is the customer or the stakeholders expectations and perspective and in our line of work we often interact with technology people and we also interact with business people and my typical day is someone's not gotten what they expected so i'm going to get a phone call to try and work through it um the last week i've actually been helping a a client uh, refine and improve their development methodology because it was so application centric. They forgot about the data details. They didn't have what the definition of success was. So walking through, wait a second, what defines success? How, how do we communicate mm -hmm. that? Getting people to communicate, but also then laying out the pieces and parts. But last week I was building a database and helping someone uh, evaluate why a query wasn't performing well and explaining how parallel databases work with row redistributions and things like that. So I, the, the center point is really someone's got data on a database somewhere. Someone's got a problem they need to solve and all the pieces in between. So I usually help them with those pieces. Oh, I like it. Well, let's get back to some of your bio too in, in a little bit here. So when, tell me, Evan, when you were very young, say six years old, was this the dream? What was the dream? <laughs> oh my goodness. When I was six years old, I grew up in um, Central Florida, and yeah. when I lived there in the uh, the mid seventies, um, the Today newspaper actually had a nice little blurb in the top right corner when the next launch was, and we'd go out in our front yard and you'd watch missiles and rockets launch, oh, and it was cool. usually once every few months. Um, so of course, like any other six year old, I wanted to be a fireman. I wanted to be an astronaut, and everybody where I lived actually drove 30 to 45 minutes to work on the Cape and a guy across the street, uh, my best friend's dad was a Apollo mission uh, inspector. People up and down the street worked in various aspects of the, the space program or in the defense. So everybody was an engineer. Um, did I know what a computer was? Well, of course not, I was six. And did I know what data was? Of course not. Um, never really touched a computer actually yeah. till my first year in college. And oh. was mesmerized um, by it. Where I went to school, I had one of the first uh, PCs and um, just became absorbed and took everything I could, got an electrical engineering degree and realized that I would rather build software than design circuits. And um, mm -hmm. had the good fortune um, of having a couple of jobs over, over uh, the summers learning that, yeah, this was really a, a line of work that I wanted to do. So I figured I'd be a programmer. Um, the whole idea of selling or interacting with business people, I thought was just a ridiculous concept. I was someone that wanted to, uh, I, I used to joke, Evan, what do you do for a living? Well, if you plug it in, it blows up, it breaks or it fails. Well, well I fix it. Um, and that's really, I did two yeah. things. I built new software and I fixed other people's broken code and did that for eh, probably five or six years. I, um, yeah, okay. I, I joined a startup company and, um, in those days, it wasn't like it is today, where everyone becomes a billionaire. It was a, uh, it was uh, it was back back in the '80s. But um, loved writing code, and yeah. ended up quickly getting pulled into client activities because I was young, single, had no limitations on travel. So I'd get on a plane when I needed to, and I'd go live with a client and build whatever software was necessary. Because the company that I worked for was was a database database uh, database computer company, as was as it was once called. And um, they had IBM mainframe connectivity, and here I was involved yeah. with the, the the internet or the network and TCP/IP version. So I built stuff in Windows and Unix or Linux or whatever the operating system. Built them applications, so they could do that stuff and um, enjoyed working with customers. As many of the people that are probably listening that are consultants or have worked in IT groups, it, it's almost an adrenaline adrenaline junkies high where you get to focus on building stuff, you deliver it, you get feedback, you go change it and fix it. And that's what I ended up doing. And um, so from age six to my early 20s, I built software. 
That's amazing. I, I like that. So, so tell me, so you got into data kind of accidentally just kind of playing with databases. Well, right? you know, it, it's, it's interesting. As I shared with you, when I worked for the database company, um, it was Teradata in the early years. Um, there were lots of people that knew how databases worked, mm -hmm. but no one was really focusing a whole lot of energy of, so what questions do you want to answer? Mm -hmm. And now that we organize the data so you could actually look at it, because in those early days, the concept of a billion record table or how do you organize tens of billions of records was not, not a common skill. So we helped them do that. But what occurred over time is I went from project to project, uh, worked at retailers, mm -hmm. worked at telco companies, utilities, and others. One of the things that happens when you're on the road and you work Monday through Friday on the road is you don't work 40 hours, you work a lot more than that. So you tend right. to gain a lot of hands-on experience in a much more compressed time than you would in a traditional company. We, there, there was no holidays, no time off, no meetings, literally, you just, you, you worked on stuff. So what ended up happening is the value that I brought to the table wasn't just how to build code, but actually how to use the data itself. So I kind of became a data person because while most companies view applications as their asset, early on, I was one of the few people that actually knew the data. So when I went and worked with a retailer, I learned about what sell-through was, what advertising and promotions were, what, mm -hmm. what pricing elasticity and those details were. So a client along the way said, you know, even if you had folks that you worked with, we would probably want them to, to join. So me being the very clever person that I was, said, well, you know, I can respond to that. I'd yeah. like to say I had some sort of magical uh, plan, but I, I hired people that had wanted to work with me and I wanted to work with because the client gave us the opportunity. But what ended up occurring was, as I would hire these people, what became valuable to the client wasn't the technical skills. It's not that they were disinterested. It was teaching and showing them how to actually use and organize the data. So it wasn't just, mm -hmm. hey, mm -hmm. help me build the dashboard. It's help me deal with a pricing analysis model. So we learned about pricing analysis. And we learned about reclamation, which for the trivia buffs out there, when you work at a grocer, you have to deal with damaged products and understanding the difference between uh, slippage, which is people stealing things or shrinkage versus things mm -hmm. that are destroyed, different animals you have to track. And in those days, we dealt with coupons. So you learned a lot of business process stuff. You learned about the data and the data shared with you, well, is the business process working or not? I know it seems a little convoluted or, or tedious, but I learned about data because when a customer is unhappy, they tell right. you, here's what I can't do. It wasn't about the tool not showing a bar chart. It's here's the information I don't have. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you start seeing those things. So learned about things like marketing, advertising, promotion, operations, revenue, and financials, and went to go work at another company that was a telco and focused where the strength was, which was in product and customer details. I wasn't an expert on phone operations or USOX or all those under, other wonderful codes, but I knew how to learn data. And then the people that, that were with me, we quickly realized the value of our skills wasn't that we brought large database expertise or analytics or code building expertise. We could learn data and we could help them organize it, not to hide it from them, but to get them in the middle of it. It's almost like training a librarian on what the Library of Congress or the Dewey Decimal System is. Well, we coached and helped clients organize data so they could analyze product-based details or customer-based details and event and existence details. And we went from being a technology company into a management consulting firm. So I had revenue analysis people and product analysis folks and customer-oriented folks and people that knew banking and telco and, and that type of stuff. I used to joke when someone said, Evan, did you plan on doing this when you got a college degree? It's like, okay, I wired stuff. I learned how concrete exploded under <laughs> duress. I learned how to write software. Of course, I never expected to um, learn about business processes. But I think in our world of software, even today, we hear about all this nifty stuff you can do with AI and machine learning. It still goes back to, you really need to understand, well, what decision does someone need to make? What action do they want to take? I used to joke that people would ask you about data and you'd have to figure out, well, do you want it because it's neat to know and you've never had it before? Because in a lot of companies, whether you want to call it big data or specialized data or whatever, they're so hungry for information. They'll ask you for things that they never had and never think about, well, how they're going to use it. And it's not that they're 
arrogant. It's that they're anxious. They want sure. that stuff. They have this enormous appetite and they're confident that if they had it, well, they'd find a use for it. And I'm certainly not here to challenge that. But if you ask one question, which is, okay, so when I give it to you, what action will you take? Um, there's always a pause and it's, it's not challenging their role. I, I'm not a, a, a product information manager or product manager. I'm just yeah. here to make one better. Um, and that migrated from the neat to know to the need to know, which is okay. Now, now let's talk about how you use this stuff. And I, my guess is my training as an engineer in college is what probably was one of the things that helped the most, which is I like to know how things work. So you ask somebody what's their decision or what's important to them, you inevitably mm -hmm. jump into how does this work? And it's not about us challenging how someone does things. It's trying to understand so I can give them the data they want and, and package it in a way that they can use it to make the decisions so they don't question it. Um, I joke, and pardon me for droning on here, but one of the biggest challenges I think we run into with, with analytics is we're so enthusiastic that we've delivered this data because people waste all this time trying to find it. We don't stop to think, well, wait a second. Now that I've delivered it, will they believe it? Because they've never had it before. Um, I mean, think about Christopher Columbus and, eh, or actually, pardon me, Copernicus and Galileo said the world was round and the church said absolutely not. And it was a little more involved than just a, a slight argument. Um, right. It, it, we deliver data and people won't believe it. So you immediately have to jump into the idea that how do I make it to defend and explain without making anybody look bad? I mean, our, our job as data professionals is not only to organize and help them get it, deliver it, and use it, but our, our goal is to not make anybody look bad. I mean, the, it, it shouldn't be an us and them. It shouldn't be contentiousness, and it shouldn't be an argument when we're building, delivering what we need. And I often tell folks, you know, take a deep breath. People get upset and angry because they don't have what they need. And if right. you give it to them, they're going to be cautious because guess what? They're not sure. Right. Um, the, 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 what we're doing is not rocket science. But, but we have to make sure that people aren't surprised. Well, I love that you talk about, you know, your being an engineer, you know, you're curious about how things uh, are work. Right. And it sounds like you've used that curiosity uh, just to kind of rephrase that a little bit uh, throughout your career. You're really curious about what the customer wants. You're curious about, you know, does, and you weren't afraid to um, learn new things, you take on new things, which is, I think, also so key to, you, were, you weren't afraid to say, you know, I don't know that, or, you know, I'm going to go learn that. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think part of it, 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 there's so many roles in this, in this data sphere or data space. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people, they just want to be DBAs. That, that's wonderful. There's, there's no harm in that. I mean, there's always going to be need for those types mm -hmm. of roles, despite what all the vendors uh, portray that everything's going to be automatically uh, managed. And it's come a long way, but we're always going to need people to help uh, build and maintain systems. Uh, there's always a need for developers to write code, even if ChatGPT or all the other AI bots can generate mm -hmm. as good a code or better. Um, but there's always going to also be this need of figuring out the problem that someone has. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I prefer to dabble in a bunch of different areas if given the opportunity of only being a DBA or only being a performance and tuning person or only being a data analyst or only being a business analyst. Well, mm -hmm. I would rather do many of them. I've had roles where that's all I did. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the perks that exists in our industry is over time, as you accumulate experience, you can now apply that. The, the, I think the biggest challenge for any of us is learning and understanding the client's data, because you also have to learn and understand all the goofs, mistakes, and anomalies that are built in over the, the, the generations of systems where data has been generated and then forklifted and put into a new system, and then forklifted and put into a new system. And you got to figure all that stuff out. So, I mean, it, it's like, you got to like puzzles. If, if you're the type mm -hmm. of person that's frustrated because you're, all your blanks aren't filled out or you're an anal type person that wants completion. Uh, what I do is probably not going to make them happy. Um, but if you're, <laughs> if you can live with, yep, the, here's the things we didn't finish today. And that's just going to be our quest for tomorrow. Then that's why I like what I do. And uh, that's, that's great. And I, and I love that you're teaching your customers 
uh, how to manage it themselves and how what you're doing and explaining and really communicating, you know, the what and why. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's a, a lot of unfair criticism, actually, to the industry where uh, people are portrayed as trying to protect their turf or protecting their job. I, I you know, I, I guess it happens. I, I don't see that very often. I think a lot of times um, we tend to work in management uh, chains and management styles where people say, stay in your lane. This is yeah. what I've asked you to do. Yeah. And in, in a lot of companies, it's it's not cultivated to, to, to go outside your lane and do other things. I mean, as a consultant, you, you have that luxury. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm a big fan of let people spread wings, expand and learn if they're comfortable with that. And, and can you manage uh, frustration? Because it's not about the 50 things you, you goofed on. It's like, did you finally accomplish and learn something? It's like taking a class, going to school. It's you studied, you studied, you studied to finally get the hang of how something works. And now you know how to do it. It's the same thing in this environment. Yeah. Uh, I, I worked with a colleague. He said, you know, this is really cool because we're paid to deliver, but we're also paid to learn. And the learning mm -hmm. isn't a tool as much as it is learning about someone's business, uh, mm -hmm. how they define success and, mm -hmm. and, and picking up speed. So, I mean, it's probably one of the reasons I enjoy teaching it at the DJIQ and the EDW uh, conferences because yeah. it, it's really about just sharing. Here's, here, let me share with you how I got beat up. So maybe you don't have to, and maybe some of the tricks and tips that, that I've learned. I love it. You know, it's part of, part of my favorite, it, it's, it's one of my favorite aspects of my job is getting to work with this community because mm -hmm. I found the community to be uh, educating me all the time because everyone is so supportive of each other. Everyone really helps each other out, whether they're, you know, it, no matter what job they're in and what company they work for, they're all helping each other to solve, you know, similar problems. And it's, it's just, I love it. It's great. You know, the, the, if there's anything that all, never continues to uh, amaze me or, or I, I'm pleased with is people's willingness to share mm -hmm. and coach, mentor, and teach you. I mean, I, I, I run into that with all the clients that I work with where they, they'll explain, here's the way this thing is. This is what obligation means. Yeah. And a current client is our budgeting process works. I, I, I guess I'm always intrigued when someone shows up and they decide to start talking instead of listening. I mean, I, we all have bad habits not so much that it's the, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of times it's not written down so right. just asking people like you say tell me how this works and just listen it's a really phenomenal amount of tribal knowledge or institutional knowledge that exists that sometimes isn't written down that's invaluable with a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry leading live online sessions throughout the year the dataversity training center is your launch pad for career success Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DBTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Indeed. So, Evan, so tell me, what was your biggest lesson so far in your career? Gosh, my <laughs> biggest lesson yeah. is don't, well, truly as a traveling person, don't be wedded to a single airline because you'll only be disappointed, but... <laughs> but <laughs> For those of you that uh, see me on Facebook, you'll inevitably see that when I, uh, I'll, I'll have a flight and if the airline is treating me poorly, I'll inevitably have a rant about stuff. I, I guess my big learning, um, ask questions and listen to what people have to say. You can learn from everyone and anyone. Don't, don't underestimate the knowledge of an individual, regardless of their title, their role or what your perception of their experience and knowledge is, just listen and ask. Because there's a lot to be learned if, if for nothing else, the way they respond. Because yeah. you're going to hear about years of frustration or experience. I worked with, a, worked with a banking client in Canada, and they were talking about, you know, that project was just a, they went on, I mean, for like five minutes about how horrible it was. And I asked, so, so when did that project happen? Oh, it was about 15 years ago. And I'm thinking, my God, 15 years ago, you talk about it like it's just yesterday. But, right. but there are cultures where, there aren't risk takers. And if there's mm -hmm. one mistake, it literally makes something nuclear or radioactive forever, which is tragic. Yeah. Um, but some cultures are in companies are not only not risk takers, but very fear based. And then there's others that, yeah, we goofed on that. Let's try it again. Um, there, there's no harm because we're, we're penalized here for doing nothing. We're not penalized for making mistakes. And I mean, it, obviously you want to be somewhere in between, but Right. But you can't learn about that stuff if you don't listen to what people tell you. It, it is amazing to me. Um, 
how diverse and different cultures can be from company A to company B, or even organizationally. And, and um, I, it, it never ceases to surprise me. So, I mean, very often um, I'm, I'm astonished when people bet their career on something. Mm. And then I've just made the remarks about how the culture can be so diverse and, and, and sometimes not good and sometimes very uh, accommodating to then, then met your job on it. I mean, at the end of the day, this should never be about a, a single milestone. This should really be, okay, how do I help get them to where they need to be? I, my old business part, you say, how, how do we skate to where the puck is? Not necessarily where we want it because it may not go there. And then how do we help the puck get to where we want it to go? Um, yeah. We're showing people not only what data is, but how to use it, how to make it simpler. Um, so, I mean, what have I learned? Listen, I mean, I, I hate to be so uh, flip or corny, but um, it's really, how do you come up with a solution that works within the environment that you're working? How do you give things that people can accept and it not uh, over-exaggerate risk or, or, or scare them? I mean, it, coming up with a technical solution is usually not the challenge. How do you introduce it? And how do you get people to adopt it in a way that no one uh, th th feels a level of risk that they're uncomfortable with? Yeah, no, I don't think it's corny at all, Evan. I think it's, I think that's a really good lesson. I wish I'd learned it a lot earlier. You know, for me, I was taught, you know, to, to go in and you're supposed to, to, to show authority, you're supposed to know everything and be right. <laughs> I, I, you know, one of the things that I always start, start off when I teach a class is, okay, yeah. I'm a consultant, which means if I put pauses when I talk and I lower the tone of my voice, people think I know what I'm talking about. It's complete crap, okay? The speed and the tone and the gaps shouldn't matter. But, but it, it, is, it is rather striking when you, when you yeah. hear really good presenters mm -hmm. um, and it's almost subconscious that they will lower their voice, they'll put a bunch uh -huh. of pauses in. A very good friend of mine in college, we had, we had this professor, Dr. George, God bless him, um, best professor I ever had. I probably took four or five classes from electrical engineering and he used to drive us batshit crazy. I, mean, I love the man, <laughs> but he would talk so slowly, it would drive us nuts. So <laughs> it's, I mean, it, 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 I mean it, it, what's interesting, if I, if I play back maybe some of the remarks I've made to you, it sounds like I'm a communications person and a psychologist, um, which, which I'm not, obviously. Um, but I think part of success when you're delivering something new to somebody is mm -hmm. you have to be comfortable in communicating with others and, and, and be transparent and not be shy and, and, and just, be, just be upfront and honest. Um, it, it's very hard um, in the consulting world or even the vendor world if you deliver something new and then you're not around there to help them learn and 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 work through it. I mean, it's like yeah. when you get this brand new whiz bang uh, appliance at home, whether it be an air fryer or a new microwave, you're all excited because it's fixing something, replacing something that's broken. And then, wow, you know where the popcorn button is, you know how this game works or whatever, and you're really excited. And then, okay, let me go to the manual. And I'm one of those people, I go to the manual and I'll read it. Um, but then you realize, after the third day and the fifth day, all you can do is popcorn. You got all this other stuff you want to cook. And then you realize, well, it's going to take me time to get acclimated to how this damn thing works to actually use it and, and gain everything I can out of it. And I think a lot of that's the same case when it comes to data. Um, when you're a consultant, obviously there's benefits of being at a client longer financially, but, but, but in reality, the, the real benefit is you can ensure that they can use what it is you built and yeah. delivered and give them the time to use those things. I think the other aha that I had in my early days of delivering dashboards or reports or applications is in, in, in this era of agile and fast delivery or continuous delivery or DevOps or, or all the various terms, we absolutely don't want to lose the, the sense of urgency. We don't want to lose the value of continuous improvement. But unfortunately, what we lost track of is it takes time for people to learn and acclimate and absorb what has been built for them to actually use it and learn it and then give you feedback. We, we, we kind of neglect that part. It's like when you have kids, you don't get the luxury of going from age six to age 12 in 20 minutes. It takes six years <laughs> and, and all right. the trials and tribulations that go between that. And 
while I'm certainly not encouraging six year uh, iterations for development, um, I, I think you have to remember, let's give the customer or the user or the stakeholder time to learn and, and give us feedback and not rush them. I mean, I, if I talk faster, that doesn't mean you're going to absorb everything. So we tend to underestimate the value of time and, and we it, it becomes one, in, one, uh, one level or the other, which is it's either too fast or, or it's too slow. And that's that would say is probably one of the other things I've learned over time, which is you, you got to give people time to learn the data. That's really good. That's really good advice. Um, so, Evan, tell me what then is your definition of data? Um, I'll give you a definition of data. I'll give you a definition of big data because everybody, it, it's it's yeah. it, it's at probably not not terribly of interest anymore. Wait, anyway, data. It, it, it's things we want to analyze, the electronic version of what happened, events, counts, amounts, details, descriptions. I, I, I tend to look at things in a way that how can I describe it to my mom? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, when we're talking about data, realistically, it's not the electronic version of it. But given what we do for a living, it is the electronic version of it. Um, I, the, the reason I, I characterize that, you got to keep it simple. I mean, there's lots of great uh, descriptions from uh, data to knowledge or information to knowledge to wisdom. Fine, I'm not here to argue with that. But th th the reason I also threw in the, the premise of big data is for many years, you'd hear everybody talking about it, and it's certainly not top of mind anymore. But when people were talking about it, it wasn't necessarily volume, variety, and so forth. It was more content that I currently have access to. So it's like when you talk to people when they have when they're raising families and they want a new house, you almost always know it's for more space. And when mm -hmm. people are talking about data and the data that they want, well, they always want more data because they want to broaden the content that they have access to. So they know more about what has happened. They want more history to know, tell me over time what has occurred. And then let me look at all the related aspects and details that, that, that I can tie to it. So thus, to respond to your question, I've told you what I think data were what my definition is, um, but I think it's it's people's appetite is such that I, I think we're going to actually challenge what those definitions mean because mm. we're in an era where the source of data is now changed. We used to talk about in the analytics and the BI world having data from the core systems, and I joke in my class, how many of you could add three new sources or five new sources in the next month? Okay, what about 500 new sources? And then at least someone speaks up, there's no chance I could have 500 sources in my company. And it's like, okay, let's bet. I'll bet you that I'm right and you're wrong. And I could come up with 500 new sources in your company. And I ask, so, so how many people do you have? And they'll say, oh, we have 10,000 people. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll bet you my house. Now, if I'm right, you have to tell your spouse, hon, I made a really bad decision today and we got 48 hours because I lost the house. I said, now if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll give you my house and I will gladly call my wife and tell her, hon, I did something that some, someone finally held me accountable to and we better get out. Obviously, I don't want anybody's home and I don't want to give mine away, but the, we have to challenge our paradigm on not only what the definition of data is, as you so eloquently put it, but, but, but also where does it come from? Because the volumes and sources why is a source not a spreadsheet? Because someone has worked diligently to come up with a new way of characterizing or identifying customer or a customer value score or a success criteria or a metric. So there's all this content out on spreadsheets. Why is that not considered a source and data? And by the way, that's how we have 500 sources because of just all the content generated internally. Then all the third-party content. Um, mm -hmm. I worked with a hedge fund and I'm not lying. They had a hundred million spreadsheets stored and wow. no way of finding them. And it wasn't a lie. It was a hunt, but it was actually more sure. than that. Um, <laughs> but but think about it, it's because someone wanted to model something that would occur in a macroeconomic manner in a particular country in a particular set of circumstances. I mean, there are people yeah. in this world that are pretty big time analysts that want to play out what happens if or what happens when. Um, and for those people who understand gaming theory, that that's really a discipline about that. A anyway, if you consider there's uh, open data, which comes from governments and financial uh, services, financial service companies about here's what's going on in the world. There's all kinds of third party 
organizations that will sell you psychographic, pharmacographic, and other types of content about human beings. There's all kinds of environmental weather and other details that are available. You can go on and on and on. And I, I think our challenge isn't how do we store the core content of our company. It's how do we manage the onboarding of an explosive amount of content? I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I tend to compare everything to retail because people understand grocery stores or uh, department stores. But, but, but think about what folks like a, like a Target or a Home Depot and what they went through with the whole online world. Suddenly, there was no limitation to what they could sell. I mean, there was always limitations to the number of shelves and square footage. And even with special order, the number of catalogs they could actually load into a desk and then the skills they'd have to give the individual that you went to the special order desk to figure it out. But, but with the internet, that all is gone. I mean, yeah. there's practically no limit to what any of these companies can sell. And then, of course, Amazon came to the table with there's no limit to what we can sell. And in fact, you can put something for sale at Amazon and never talk to somebody. I mean, yeah. one of the things that I, I, I tell clients is, you know something, I, I would argue our biggest challenge when it comes to data is, yeah, what is it and how do you define it, you're, as your point mentioned, but maybe our role isn't data management. Maybe our role is more about in, in analytics because we've built and organized our environments really to deliver reports and dashboards. We haven't really designed and built them yet, at least across the board, to make data self-service and, and, and shareable. And I would argue really the next step maybe is how do we instill data sharing how do we how do we have our data strategy reflect um how does someone find the data without picking up the phone Can, is it possible in your company to publish and share information without you contacting a technologist and without a user being able to find it contacting a technologist i mean one of the clients i work with now we we've positioned this concept of a data marketplace and mm -hmm. not a marketplace from a selling perspective, but more from a bazaar. I mean, and I don't mean bazaar peculiar. I mean, like right. think about a, a Mideastern bazaar mm -hmm. where people come in to trade, communicate, learn, and share anything imaginable. If you've ever been in any of the souks in countries in the, the Mideast, you hear about the spice market or the gold market, but literally anything. And I, I would say one of our big challenges is how do we reposition or remodel or remold or reshape our data environments to support that because ultimately that's what I think people want. I mean, data should be an office supply. It, yeah. it, it shouldn't require me to get on the phone and pardon me for, again, ranting on, but, but I think we really have an opportunity to not just redefine it and, and challenge what a source is, but also what are we really trying to accomplish? Very much so, you know, and you, and you keep coming back to that. And I love that theme, you know, what is it that we do it's got that question of curiosity again right what what is it we're trying to accomplish what's the end goal um I mean, think about the space yeah. program i mean they started with mm -hmm. how do i get someone to get a thing to go around the earth which prior to that i mean people forget okay. that it was what uh it was like was it 190 pardon me if i get the dates wrong 1903 1905 and 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 when was when were you able to put 400 people in the sky fly them back and forth to hawaii as a commodity like uh 60 years and then how right. many how many years did it take to actually not put an object around earth but in fact a whole bunch of people and send them to the moon really an astonishing but it, it wasn't about uh going around the earth it was about space travel and now we're talking about space colonization so obviously what we're talking about with data is not nearly is, is sophisticated <laughs> but but i think we have to challenge our views because we sometimes forget what people really want to accomplish. They just want to answer questions and they don't want to call anybody. They just want to be able to do it themselves. It's like, yeah. you, if we um, ran companies the way we sometimes handle data, if you needed a pen, you'd have to call somebody and they'd have to yeah. order it and they have to go pick it up. It's like, no, I go to the, I just go get the pen. Um, and, and while it is an asset, we really do want to commoditize it. We want to make it simple. So anybody can find it, use it and, and, and understand its value. Well, Evan, then uh, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years? Um, it's it's going to explode. Um, uh, the, the whole game here is we now not, our goal isn't to organize data so a programmer or a mm -hmm. data knowledgeable person can access this stuff. 
but in fact, how do we educate people so they can share with each other mm -hmm. and they don't duplicate the data and they can find and they can, can identify what it is. I mean, how many people in the 1970s knew what a UPC code is? Now it's built into our phone. I can right. go up and scan and, and it takes me someplace. Um, I, I, with the last 40 or 50 years of knowledge, think about what's feasible uh, and what we need to accomplish with data management. I think that there's a phenomenal opportunity here. And by the way, it's not about doing away with our jobs. It's doing away with our jobs as they currently are. I mean, we've got online books. We've got online data, all kinds of content. The value of librarians hasn't gone away. The, the, right. the skill in the field of library science is probably more valuable now than it is. In fact, that's one of the skill areas I think is probably more appropriate to data management than anything, which is how do you organize information and then educate others how to do it so they can be self-sufficient? Because I get into many discussions about the power and the wonder of AI and, and machine learning and chat GPT and all those things. Like if you don't have the data, none of this works. And mm -hmm. if you can't find the data, none of this works. And if you can't characterize the data, none of this works. People talk about, well, chat GPT gave me an accurate answer. Well, that's because it didn't know the details about that data. So the whole discipline of metadata management or cataloging, it's in its infancy. Um, yeah. So do I think it's going to grow? I think I've probably answered that question. Do I think there'll be more jobs? <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. do I think data management professionals will always be in a role of explaining ourselves and doing missionary work and educating people about problems that they have they don't even know they have? Yeah. And do I think the challenge is, let's make sure we characterize things correctly. If they don't have a metadata dictionary, is it a, a disappointment and an obsolete? But it's not a catastrophe, okay? I mean, we need to sometimes take a deep breath. And again, don't focus on the problem that exists. Focus how you solve it and then get the folks to the next next step or next phase. So yeah, yeah um, I, I only wish people appreciated it more. Um, What's sexy is the applications. That'll always be sexy, but if you don't have the data, none of it works. Yeah, it's very true. So you've given a lot of great advice already, Evan. I mean, it, it just, you know, what any additional advice you give to somebody who's just looking to get into a career in data management? Anything they should study, anything they should, you know, aside from being curious? Um, um, so, so I have a group of friends I see every day when I take my dog to the park. We're all a bunch of crackpots. And we decided to all throw in a few dollars and buy the lottery ticket. And one of them said, well, Evan, why should we bother? Um, so, well, you, you can't win if you don't play. So we've had a good time and just a few dollars. And then, well, Evan, this one's not worth, it's less than 100 million. Why should we bother? I said, wow. So now winning is not even important to you for the cost of $2. I, I use that as analogy. You, you know, mm -hmm you have to appreciate and enjoy that it's a game and how do we make data easier to use and whether it's big data or small data that's not the value the value is someone's ability to answer a question and take a business action and you don't know that when you see the data mm -hmm. so don't poo poo a small piece of data over here or a really complex and sophisticated data set over there because at the end of the day it's about the value of the the, the business question and the answer and that could be that could be staggering oh such great advice evan this has been such a pleasure i really enjoyed talking to you oh my gosh so many great uh moments in the conversation here um and i would i would re remiss to ask if i didn't ask uh what if somebody wanted to solicit your services how would they find you oh well uh, that would be wonderful, but certainly uh, not expected. Um, I, I have a website. Um, I'm on mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Uh, I have an email address, evan at evanjlevy.com. Uh, and I'm sure the podcast will have all those appropriate uh, uh, connections. And I'm pretty good about responding to mail. I, I travel a fair amount, but but certainly happy to uh, interact. And, and like I said, you can also find me on, on LinkedIn. Perfect. And yes, we will absolutely publish those with the podcast. So, and I'll see you soon. In a few weeks. Yes. In yes. Anaheim. Uh, looking forward to it. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Likewise. So uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest in podcasts and the latest in data management education, you may go to datacity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time and stay curious. 
Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.